Thank you, Thomas, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate this is the, uh, perhaps the last uh, event for the day and probably the meet as well. People are waiting for uh, the farewell uh, meeting, finally. So, well, thank you, and uh, uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to just talk about uh, a few things which I think will be a little different from perhaps a lot of the meetings that all of you have sat in, uh, you know, through the last three days. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, I'm going to be speaking. Uh, I'm going to be speaking mostly for the subject of e-learning or technology-enabled learning. Uh, I'm going to speak on behalf of my own experience as an e-learning specialist. I've been in the business for about 22 years. Uh, I'm the CEO. Just to introduce myself, my name is Raju Ganapathy. I'm the CEO of a company, a consulting firm in India and in the U.S. by the name of Conscience. Uh, I've had the good opportunity of working with schools, colleges, universities, community schools, I mean all formats uh, in kind of bringing in different formats of learning and education, mostly technology and digital. So it could be high touch in the class with components with digital, it could be less touch and it could be no touch. And in the last couple of years we've seen so much more, uh, you know, the, the in-between ones with the, with the less touch, and of course, there's a completely self-paced and on-demand as well. Uh, I did not intend to bring in a dark cloud in this room with the things that I'm going to say, so please be mindful and, uh, you know, apologies if I, if I do get, you think I get in that direction, but that's not my purpose. Uh, I'm going to be speaking for certain things that are fundamental, uh, but oftentimes just missed out. Uh, it's rather easy to actually start finding solutions once you know that there is a problem. But oftentimes, you really do not know that there is a problem. And if you don't know that there's a problem because you heard of it, then we're going to try and find where is that problem. The third step is to really start looking for solutions. So perhaps I'm going to be spending my time talking about the first two, which is first trying to even get the sense that, A, there is a problem, for lack of a better expression or a word, and perhaps where are those problems. So I'm going to probably focus on that in the next, you know, in the remaining part of this. I do speak a lot. I'm going, to not, I'm going to rely much less on the screen there. It's going to be mostly coming in from me, from my experiences. So by all means, just stop me, put up your hand, you know, put up your hand, ask questions. Or of course, you can keep this for the later, later part as well. So without further ado, I'm going to be speaking for, you know, what is it that's changed, really? I mean, did things change so rapidly in the last five years? Maybe, maybe not, but all of them find their genesis in certain institutionalized practices. Uh, I could date this back to the Industrial Revolution, where uh, the first Industrial Revolution to whatever, you may want to call it the third, the fourth, and I think Google is also speaking for the fifth Industrial Revolution, so uh, I'd rather let you number that. But fundamentally, where are the issues, what are the problems, and how are we really looking at things? So I think the first thing I'm going to uh, bring your attention to is the fact that fundamentally, the epicenter is shifting. Why are things the way they are, the good, bad, and the not so good? Uh, that's fundamentally because of the shifting epicenter. For the last 100, 150 years, we've been used to a certain format of teaching and a certain format of learning. It's basically brick and mortar. We've had faculty sit in their car, drive to the university, or get to the school, We've had the teacher standing in front of the class and then students facing the teacher, and then having a very personal touch of how learning is imparted. That's where things started, and we basically were, and when I say we, I'm speaking for the educators. They were in control of the learning dissemination process. That has happened for much of the last 150 years of modern living, whether it's a developed country or whether it's a developing country or still to be developed country. Now, very rapidly, we see that shifting epicenter where, again, I say this respectfully and mindfully, I have the highest respect for educators. I do not think and I hope uh, for 100 years after we're gone, the, the instructors will still be the powerhouse because it comes from sheer experience, their knowledge, and their wisdom. And wisdom is an accumulation of experience of life, which obviously you're not going to find in, even as a 25-year-old. But having said that, uh, the sage on the stage it's again the instructors in the center of the overall teaching and dissemination process. So the teacher or the instructor belongs to a certain institute. That institute is determining whether you're in an Ivy League in the US or whether you're in a, you know, in a good college or whatever, whichever institution you are part of. It's basically a top-down approach where the faculty is basically teaching the curriculum, the pedagogy, and the content of what it is the institution provides for the most part. And then we, you know, we have the learners, and then of course we have the content. 
So if you see the triangle on the left-hand side, again, it's very heavily focused around the teaching dissemination process where we have the sage on the stage, very respectfully. Now, obviously, in the last five years, and you could, you could take this to 10 or 15, but more so pronounced since the, uh, the, the advent of the pandemic, we're now seeing people taking lives in their own hands. And now, very quickly, the instructor has actually left, and we see the learners at the center of the learner journey. That incidentally happens to be a product that we've built. Uh, I'll keep that for later. But the learners at the center of the learner journey. It's now the students who are actually experiencing learning the way they think it should be. It's no longer one institute. I may be a student of this college or university, but I'm consuming content from LinkedIn. I'm taking something from MOOCs. I'm taking something from Open Educational Resources. Um, and perhaps I'm not even inter interested in a degree anymore. I'm probably looking for uh, vocational training. I want to do something in the next three months and find myself a job. So power, more power to the learners. And that shift, I would respectfully say, is the, is the opening theme of this conversation here. If we understand that, things roll in from there onwards. So if I may say, again, very respectfully, uh, Content that was created, and we're speaking as educators, and we're speaking in a, in a learning management system or a VLE uh, conference. Uh, the content that was created in the traditional format was actually never, was never made for students to consume themselves. I would underline that, and I would also put it in quotes. It was, ever, it was never made for the students. So any problem that you speak about, the genesis of that problem is the fact that that content was not for the students. It was actually for the faculty, for the teachers, for the trainer, to use their soft skills, to use their knowledge, and disseminate that pro into, down to the audience in a high-touch classroom, brick-and-mortar environment. Now, we've not seen any of that in the last two years. Unfortunately, the world needed a pandemic uh, to explain this, this theory. That's sad, but that's also the truth. So now when we're actually going from a high-touch classroom-based environment to an environment where students are now empowered, or at least they believe they are, uh, and they take their choices, they're actually looking for learning that sticks for them. Are, they, are we creating sufficient learning hooks? Are we going to get them coming back for more? Uh, then I think, respectfully, we need to have a mindset change. We need to have a change of creating content that was earlier teacher-facing, instructor, faculty facing, trainer facing, to now directly student facing. I say that with my background in instructional design, pedagogy, and andragogy, depending on which audience we're dealing with. So that's the first thing. We're going from content that's now speaking to, the t or speaking to students through the teacher to now directly speaking to the learners. If we understand that well, and a lot of good universities and companies, uh, companies universities, schools, understand that when they implement their digital programs, uh, they understand this genesis. And when they take the efforts to creating, overhauling their design in the content, they do find success at the end of it. We've seen a lot of that as well. So that's the first thing, uh, shifting epicenter. And you know, the next thing that I would really touch upon is for what I just spoke about. Now, all of this is, is, is good when you speak for this shift in, uh, shift in the paradigm, going from here to there, as I just explained. What does that really mean when you talk about using tools, technology, and digital as a mean of means of learning? Now, at a Moodle conference, using technology and, and, and digital, I think structurally, I take this back perhaps to the time Martin founded Moodle. I'm going to say this in a Moodle conference, but you know, whether you're on, on, a, on one VLE or something else, and whether you have a choice of uh, 50 other digital tools, these tools were actually made at a time when we actually had the former, which was the didactic uh, method of teacher imparting learning to the students. That's fundamentally what we will see in the, in the design of platforms. If we see uh, any VLE, including if we see Moodle, uh, it has been designed keeping in mind how teachers teach. But how do teachers teach? In the erstwhile methodology. Today, it's not important whether you run a 20-week course or a 50 topics, whether you choose a topic format or a course format. But that's, again, linear thinking. That's didactic and linear. Students are interested in outcomes. Students are interested in, OK, what is the learning objective? What is the learning outcome? 
how do I understand this piece of content? And that's not going to be necessarily spelled out in module number 23, page number 44. That's meaningless for uh, the audience. So specifically for instructional design versus structural design, what I'm really talking about is the point where the rubber meets the road. Uh, more often than not, I say this also because we've just, you know, beta launched a product called My Learner Journey. It's directly been launched for uh, schools, colleges, and universities here in the EU. Uh, you know, I'll talk about this, please. You can stop by. But fundamentally, when we talk about the science of instruction, that's the forte of instructional designers. They understand the science. The science goes back 200 years. All through the last three days, whether you talk about a Bloom's taxonomy, a Garnier, a David Merrill, a Vygotsky, a Piaget, there are a half a dozen to one dozen very good instructional design methodologies at play. The science goes back 200 years. How do we make effective, efficacious learning? But the last 30, 40 years have been around using tools and digital and technology to do that same process. Now, it's all good to have this great team of instructional designers who understand how to deal with teaching as a subject and how to deal with content, but that's my left hand. My left hand needs to speak to my right hand, which is what I talk about as structural design. So in this case, the, the instructional design is my left hand and the structural design is my right hand. Now, how do these two people meet? It's gonna be funny for some of you who are probably dealing with this process. You need your developer to sit on the same side of the table as your uh, designer. I've been doing it for 22 years. I say that with humility, but that's where the rubber meets the road. So when you have to actually explain, so a lot of the technology that we deal with today is actually coming from the erstwhile methods of teaching. And that's why platforms, regardless of what we see in the US and outside, uh, we're a US company, so we, you know, we, that's probably our, our largest uh, market. Uh, there is a lot of grinding, or to say the least, friction between how design should be from a teaching methodology versus how design is from the way the application is built under the hood. And the future generation of platforms, even the future of Moodle, I hope, and, will, and I'm pretty confident, uh, has to address this particular aspect of design thinking from a teaching standpoint to how a platform is conceived and finally delivered. And that's still a long journey from, from, where, from where I can see it uh, today. So that's the fundamental of instructional design versus structural design. I did touch upon this earlier, but uh, I think you're getting the point just by reading the title. Uh, didactic instruction, the page paradigm versus adaptive and personalized. I, I already touched upon this a little bit. Uh, it's very linear. Uh, if, I mean, we were at a point where actually we were consuming earlier, even till my generation, which was 25 years ago when I finished studying, uh, we were learning the way we were being taught. Now it's not about the way we're being taught. We're deciding, deciding as students for the much younger generations how we want to learn. And now we have not one, not three, but 55 choices, whether I want to study, you know, completely self-paced, completely on demand, a hybrid, even my tools, whether I want to go back to paper or whether I want, you want to use a simulation. So again, coming out of the page paradigm and everything that you would see in every format, regardless of the tool, is very didactic in format. That's perhaps why we find friction between what we're conceiving as a good implementation versus actually what the users think they're consuming as learners at the center of that learner journey. Uh, perhaps that's my next slide, but I already said it, so. Uh, and sorry, I did not come uh, rehearsed. Uh, this, I'm just speaking for what I'm seeing here. But that's the fundamental thing. Now we're really talking about adaptive and personalized learning. Now what I consume should be suitable for my needs. Um, perhaps if I go back to my childhood, I, I would just say this one thing. I've not been an educator. I've been working with educators all my career, uh, creating great efficacious learning solutions. But only if an educator spent the first five minutes explaining to a little child, and I have a seven-year-old, uh, to her, if you, if you study this now, 20 years later, you're going to be applying it here. Maybe you're going to be constructing that bridge in London or Paris or in India or wherever else. That association is extremely important. And, you know, the why automatically may bring, you know, may have little kids changing their career pathways. Uh, we've, we're all a function of our environment, and we've only done what we've been 
you know, experiencing in that space. So anyways, that's didactic instruction and the page paradigm that's mostly uh, seen in platforms in methods of instruction versus adaptive and personalized, which is also being used very effectively in a lot of scenarios. And of course, the experience through the eyes of the beholder. Again, it's the learners at the center of the learner journey. And um, it is definitely becoming more online. It is becoming more blended and more hybrid. Now, what does that mean? It really requires for the first three things, in my opinion, that I just spoke about to be, you know, you need to take a hard look at it, right, from the, the methods of instruction to the platform and technology that you choose. And the platform and technology that gets built has to address whether it's actually the learners at the center of the learner journey. We're building, I mean, uh, you could be creating content in a Word document and a PowerPoint and PDF, and you, we could very well do that for the next 50 years, and that's very effective. And for the ones that spend a lot of money and time and effort, they're also building out simulations and high-end simulations. It's not about the medium, it's about the design process that we apply, even with paper and pencil. And if we bring the learners in the center of that process, we have good instructional designers who can actually help that process. Now, again, I have been speaking on the subject of instructional design for much of my career, and I know I only scratch the surface, even if I try it for another 22 uh, years. Uh, the what of the teaching obviously comes from, is the prerogative of the subject matter expert, the faculty, the staff. But the how-to of the teaching is not one that will come more naturally. The science of instructional design, the how-to of the teaching comes very well from the instructional designers. That's why it's so important for instructional designers to you know, mate with and sit down with faculty to actually improve the design process of whatever it is you're building, whether it's paper or whether it's a flying object on the screen. The, the medium does not matter. So that's what I would speak for in terms of uh, experience through the eyes of the beholder. And of course, in a conference like this, and I speak for the future of where these platforms go, um, in, back in June, I was at the One EdTech, which is now the One EdTech, it was uh, the IMS Global Learning, the, the makers of interoperable standards. Up until this moment, we're still dealing with a very limited number of, may I say, connected platforms. Uh, this is going to multiply by 100 within the next three years and no one person or one company controls that. I, I'm very confident of that. We all thought that you know, the makers of VLEs, uh, even if they've been around for 10 or 20 years, have the right pass, to, the first pass to you know, starting to teach students when, when, they, when it becomes relevant, uh, which is through the pandemic of the last two years. Little did we know that there's a company called maybe a Zoom, that's actually where 95% you know, of learning has actually happened. So are we going to focus on Zoom and Microsoft Teams, or do we, go, do we put up our hands and say, no, we're the makers of wheelies here, or something else that, no, it's not going to be that way. So the hub and the spoke model, in, in all of what I just described, we're talking about connected ecosystems. We're talking about perhaps Wheelie as the hub, unless something else comes and changes it in the future. But we're talking about a myriad and an infinite number of connected spokes. You have assessment tools. We have a lot of great companies that are presenting a lot of their own engines, including the gentleman who was speaking for the note taking on a video uh, software. So regardless how, I mean, if you have 10 components that you think you're going to use for learning, for assessment, for survey, for blog, for quiz, uh, you, know, you know what you're using. Each of those have at least 10 more in terms of options to choose from. So that automatically is a spider web of 50 to 100. So we have to be mindful of when we're designing these platforms, or rather when we decide how we want to bring the learner journey for our respective program, we're not dealing with one or two, but we're dealing with at least 15, 20 different connected spokes. And that's basically the future in my personal opinion. Uh, this is perhaps the last in my presentation here, but I'd like to touch upon the subject. Sorry, I want just to go back. I mean, of course, when I'm speaking for the hub and the connected spokes, I am obviously speaking for good interruptible solutions. Um, LTI, Learning Tool Interruptibility, from the One Tech uh, framework is great. Uh, it's powerful, of course, it's questionable on, you know, on a lot of things, like security and things, but they're all getting resolved uh, as we speak. So the more we embrace standards, we're more open to actually adapting to outside uh, technologies still being safe and secure with the students, with GDPR, with data, et cetera. 
Perhaps uh, design for analytics is the last slide of my presentation. I want to just take that's right. But I, this was not intentional, but this is unfortunately how it happens as well. Analytics is generally an afterthought, uh, just like my slide. Uh, it should not have been the last slide. It, had, it should have actually been the very first slide. But it's a pity. Uh, when you're actually talking about analytics, it's not about, OK, we finished teaching this course. Now let's see what we can find out of it. Uh, <laughs> So it should actually be the first step. So there are universities, there are schools, there are great companies on this planet in training and corporate training and L&D, where if you actually are creating, let's say, the simplest, uh, even a didactic course or a fa fairly advanced simulation. Uh, in my company, we're actually, let's say, we're building a lot of biology and physics and chemistry labs. Uh, how do you do a grand stream? Uh, stain, you know, uh, how do you test the bacteria? It's a 37 step process. Now, in each of those 37 steps, you could actually be bringing in, uh, you could actually be bringing in, you could pre design what it is you want to actually gather as important data. Not let for a platform to find out some data and show it to you, but a good instructional designer through the course design process will actually help. So, when if you're Familiar with the concept of storyboarding, which is the, you know, for me is the blueprint for any design process in course design and development. In the process of storyboarding, a good instructional designer will actually put in the elements of what is meaningful, actionable data for me. And that could be the 37 step gram stain. It could be going to a minus 20 degrees, you know, refrigeration unit where you have to do an advanced simulation, you know that this gentleman at this eighth step uh, did this step wrong in the second attempt. There is science that's already ready. It's the equivalent of what Google, Facebook, and all the other big five tech, I mean, they probably know the number of people sitting in this room by our names, just by virtue of our cell phones in our pocket. The same science is already there. It's ready. It's applicable to the science of learning as well. So when you create a course the next time, I would definitely advocate, recommend, and feel very proud if I see more of solutions where design for analytics is the first step, not the last step. And with that, I want to thank you all. I'm not sure of the time, but thank you all for your time. And uh, I, want to, I want to leave it on this, but we are actually uh, piloting a project. We're in beta phase for universities, schools, and colleges specifically here in, within the European Union. And that's a specific product where you'll find us in the, in the alley. And uh, we're happy to show it to you specifically, again, if you're a, if you're a school, college, or uh, university. Tom, thank you again, and happy to take any questions if there is time. Um, we experience at our universities that students are keen to come back to university. Yeah. So um, there is some issue about arguing that, well, it's, it's the end of the, the time where you go into a lecture hall and listen to the teacher. Because if you ask students, they're keen to come back to university, not only to, to these lectures, but to see each other. What, what is your expectation? How will this be connected with your approach of this learner-centered, not non-physical um, be together setup of learning? Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a great question, and uh, I, I think that will also help me clarify perhaps all of what I said in the last 20 odd minutes. Uh, I want to say the first sentence, which does not even have to do with learning as a, as a subject, but humans by nature are supposed to be symbiotic, and that's why we're so dying to get back and meeting people and embracing people. Three weeks from now, I'm going to be probably giving people in Denver a hug. I'm going to be meeting with people at the EDUCOS conference. So yes, so first and foremost, people are symbiotic by nature. Uh, since I run a company, I'm also not for work from home. I am for work from office. I want people, I want my staff coming back. Uh, so that's point number one. People are going to be doing that. So it's not about the physical location of where people are. It's the method and it's the mindset. Now, whether you find your students sitting in the house or whether you find them in front of you, even if they're sitting right here as a student, the methods and the science of how that student thinks has changed in the last, over the last 150 years, which is what I'm trying to pronounce here. So nothing has changed. This is, this, I'm not trying, again, as I said earlier, the, uh, the, the teacher, the sage on the stage is extremely important. 
the connection, the mentorship is very important. But the methods around it has to be one that embraces students at the center, not the physical proximity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, really interesting discussion. Um, interesting for you to bring up the idea of the friction and talking about being instructional designers and developers to be on the same side of the table. And you were saying that you do consulting work. Is, I mean, I, yes, we do. It's most yes. of what you do. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Do you find that people are ready to sit down at the same time at the side of the table oh. that they've identified <laughs> that there is a there is a there is structural things that instructional designers can help with that if yeah. they were on the same side yeah. things would go better? Yeah. Uh, sh short answer uh, is disappointing, right? Uh, if you achieve ten percent, I think you have a big win. That's my experience with this subject. Uh, I'm saying that from my conscience. The name of my company is also Conscience, so I have to be honest with you. But yes, that is the big change that is required. Uh, our methods of how we seek need to change. I, I'm perhaps getting to the level of philosophy here, but I have to stop at that. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I mean, again, of course, we, uh, if I speak for, I mean, the, this is not about, again, what I'm specifically doing or my company is doing, but uh, yes, there are great universities and schools and colleges, and these need not have to be very big and most pronounced. Uh, people who understand these things are finding success in great pockets. I can say that from 22 years of practice. When I'm trying to give an intelligent solution to somebody here today in 2023, almost, I am perhaps saying the same thing that I did probably 15 years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, and it's still accepted as a great suggestion. Yeah, it is a great suggestion. It's not one that's they're, that they're using, but it needs the realization. So if we can embrace the fact that we're educators, we understand the subject matter, the SME, the subject matter experts understand the what of the teaching, but the how to, in the US more specifically, it's a two-year degree program. These are people with a background in psychology or education. They're teaching, they're educators for 15 years, 20 years. Then they go and take a certificate program in instructional design. And there they learn the, I mean, one of the biggest challenges, you have a large course. To decide which piece of that content is best suitable for what format is a science and an art combined. So that's better left to a set of folks that can actually suggest. And that's what I would advocate. And yes, the short answer to your question, yes, there are successes. I mean, the large ones do it very well in, in all parts of the world, but it needs, I think, more embracing. Thank you.